and welcome to another webinar from the Philips Lighting University. Um, today's webinar is titled Is it all just flicker? And this will be presented to you by Dragan Sekulovsky, who is a senior scientist at Philips uh, Lighting Research. Thanks for joining us to discuss uh, flicker and in general temporal light LED lighting quality. But before I discuss that, I want to start with something that we haven't discussed in a long time. And that is some advantages of incandescent lighting. We all know that they are a very efficient heat source. Unfortunately, they give, a, give out a bit of light, so that doesn't make them very good light sources. Another advantage that we don't talk about very often is that incandescent lighting is slow. Relatively slow, relatively speaking. What this means is that it reacts very slow to the change of driving current. So, for example, if I put an incandescent bulb to AC mains, instead of seeing the full modulation of the AC mains, we see something like this. I will discuss a bit later what this means. It's just some representation of the intensity of the light. So you see that actually there is a bit of modulation, but it's not very big. Now we go back to more modern lighting, the LED lighting. And I want to discuss about the main advantages of LED lighting from my point of view. I come from applications and for me the energy efficiency is not that important. But what is important is the fast temporal response, almost arbitrary spectrum. These things together enable us multi-channel control, full color control, dynamic lighting, a lot of wonderful stuff. They are small, very bright light emitting surfaces. They have a small, very bright light emitting surface, so it's very easy to build optics around them. But it's not all advantages with LED lighting. The main challenges that we have with LED lighting are actually the same. Similar to people, the main advantages are also their main disadvantages. Because of the fast temporal response, whatever you do wrong with the driving current, you see directly in the light. You can have almost any spectrum, but the question is then, what spectrum should I make? So a lot of the spectra are then wrong. It's harder to pick the real, the one that uh, actually matters. And a small, very bright light emitting surface means a lot of more glare. But all those things are not that important for today's talk, but the fast temporal response is. So if you remember in the first slide, I showed you how a typical incandescent light intensity looks like. Here I show you a few typical, if I can say typical, light output from LEDs that are connected to AC mains. As you can see, anything goes. You can have something that is indistinguishable from no modulation. You can have more modulation, even more, even more. We can have AC LEDs, which are basically just directly connected to the AC mains. And you can have some really crazy waveforms. This is an actual one from a LED lamp on the market. Everything gets even crazier once we connect a dimmer to the story. So before the lamp, we connect a dimmer. And this is an example of an LED driver that was very, that didn't have much modulation when it was connected to a switch. But once we connect it to a dimmer, it starts getting more and more modulated, the light output. In some cases, we even have intended modulation of light. Positive modulation enables very easy control of the light output. And it is used a lot in the full color control and dynamic lighting, as I mentioned before. So these are the main causes of temporal light modulation, the AC mains, and sometimes intended modulation. Before I go further into discussing what this temporal modulation can do, I want to discuss a few things about how can we char characterize this modulation. This is an example of an intended waveform, typical pulse width modulated system where we have squares, and I want to show a few things on that square. We have a maximum intensity, a minimum intensity, and the ratio of the difference between the maximum and the minimum and the sum of the maximum is minimum is something that we call modulation depth. Then we have a period of the waveform. Typically, we have waveforms that repeat themselves over time. And then the time that it needs 
the waveform needs to repeat itself, we call a period, and one over that period we call a frequency. For square waves, we typically also define something called a duty cycle. A duty cycle is the ratio of the time that the light output is above a certain level, typically 10%, over the total period. So here it is given by dt over t. Another way of characterizing the amount of temporal modulation is something called a flicker index. And a flicker index is defined as the area above the average light intensity over the total area of light intensity for one cycle of the temporal waveform, as you can see on the picture. So it's this area over the total area. What I would really like to stress here is that both modulation depth and flicker index are measures of the temporal modulation, not the effect that it has on people or machines. This is just a way how we can measure how much modulation there is in the light output. This is a bit confusing because flicker index is called flicker index. So it implies that the flicker index can be used to measure flicker. That is not necessarily true. In some cases it can be used, in some cases it cannot. Similar thing for modulation depth. Modulation depth is often given as a percentage from 0 to 100 percent and then it's sometimes called flicker percent. Again, it has nothing to do with flicker at this point. It only has to do something with the amount of modulation. So we have modulation, we know how to, how to characterize it, but why should we care about modulation, if there is modulation or not? Well, modulation can have, can have unwanted effects on our vision, on health and well-being. It can lead to changes in visual perception, what something we call temporal artifacts, and those can decrease task performance, cause visual fatigue, and actually quite important, can cause annoyance. It can also increase headache occurrence, and for people with photosensitive epilepsy, it can trigger an attack. For the first movie that I will show today, if you have photosensitive epilepsy, please uh, look away during the first movie. It can also in, in, introduce safety problems. For example, rotating machinery in industry can appear stationary with modulated light. So the operators then can have a health, uh, safety problem. It can also interfere with machine vision and imaging devices, slow motion cameras, barcode scanners. So there are many reasons why we should care about temporal modulation and how much temporal modulation there is. For this presentation, I will only talk about changes in visual perception. So I will not talk about health, I will not talk about machine interference or safety. So what I say will be mainly on a human in a real environment. If we start looking in literature about temporal light artifacts, so the changes in perception that are caused by temporal modulation, we find for in the lighting literature we find only one definition and only one artifact that is studied and that is flicker. The CIE defines flicker as the impression of unsteadiness of visual perception induced by a light stimulus whose luminance or spectral distribution fluctuates with time. If we look at all the things that the visibility of flicker depends on, we have quite a list. So the sensitivity of flicker depends on frequency. If you take any, any of these lines given on the graph, you have frequency on the x-axis and then the sensitivity on the y-axis. So you see that for different frequencies, we have different sensitivity to flicker. We are most sensitive to flicker between, let's say, 10 and 20 hertz, and there we can see really, really small modulation. Another thing that the visibility of flicker depends on is the shape of the modulation. I showed you in the example a square waveform, but that can also be sinusoidal, square again, 
or crazy, like I showed you before. And for Flickr, in the 60s, when there was a lot of uh, experiments done on Flickr, the language showed that different waveforms that have the same fundamental energy in the, same, in the fundamental frequency, they have also the same visibility threshold. So this is important for the measures that we propose and the general methods that we propose. It also depends on the mean luminance, the size of the flickering stimulus. So if you have a very, very small, let's say a two degree visual angle flickering stimulus, you are much less sensitive to high frequencies than if you have a much larger stimulus. It also depends on the position in the visual field, central versus peripheral vision. If you ever noticed while working on a CRT that the person sitting next to you has a flickering monitor, it's not the settings of their monitor, it's that in peripheral vision you're more sensitive to high frequencies. So for them, also your monitor looked flickering and their monitor didn't. What is very important for lighting is that lighting is typically full field, so it's all around us. So we also need measures that can predict the sensitivity in such a full field. So, in literature we know how to handle, how to model flicker. We have the definitions, we have the models, and it's all great. Question is, is it all flicker? This also brings me back to the first time that we started working on temporal light artifacts. A few years ago, some of our colleagues brought us a prototype that was very cheap, it was very energy efficient, but they thought there was something wrong with it. So they brought it to us and asked, I'm not really sure what it is about it, maybe it's flickering, maybe it's not, can you figure out if it's okay or not? That prototype used AC LEDs, so it had a lot of modulation. And we did what we typically do. We put a lot of people in a room with the prototype. We give them a few tasks under different conditions. Here the most important conditions were the condition where we had modulated light and non-modulated light. So we used the same exact LED, same brightness, same color temperature, but modulated and non-modulated light. We gave them regular office tasks for five minutes, reading, writing, working on a computer. And then we asked them to evaluate many things about the lighting. Brightness, color temperature, among others, we asked them if they see flicker or restlessness. Finally, we also asked them about a general evaluation of the lighting. Do they like the lighting, yes or no? What we see is that when, when we showed them modulated light, people said they did not see flicker. On the other hand, if you compare the results from non-modulated and modulated light, people were really not satisfied with the modulated light. So there is something else that is not flicker that makes them annoyed by the light, not happy with the light, but definitely they would not characterize it as flicker. So we did a follow-up experiment in which we added another typical office task of sorting a deck of playing cards as fast as possible because we suspected that if you have motion, what irritates them will be more visible. And that is indeed what turned out to be true. We also asked them to have general comments on the experience with light. And if we analyze the general comments, one thing that was very often mentioned was that they could see something that they call flicker during motion. So what I want to give a as a conclusion from this story is that to the users there is more than just flicker. But also to find out what exactly it is and how to characterize it we need to do we need to be in an application with application specific tasks. It was at this point obvious that the definition that we had for flicker was not enough to explain well all the things that we see. So Partly because of that, we started a TC in CIE, TC183, in which for the first two years we were just discussing definitions. So I will uh, give you a quick glimpse of the definitions and I will try to explain them with simpler words than what you have on the slides, but on the slides you can have the actual definitions. <coughs> 
We say that any change in visual perception that is induced by a light stimulus that changes over time is called a temporal artifact or a temporal light artifact. If you can see that modulation directly without any movement, either by you or any movement in the environment, then we call it flicker. And when I say movement by you, I mean moving your eyes. So in the rest of the story, when I say a static observer, I mean an observer that doesn't move their eyes. I'm moving my hand at the moment, you cannot see that, but that still makes me a static observer. This also includes periodic and non-periodic fluctuations, and it can be induced by the light source, the power source, other influence quantity. If you have a change in motion perception, so if you see some problems when something moves in your environment, even though your gaze is static, then we call that the stroboscopic effect. An example of that we will see very shortly. The final effect that I will spend the least time talking about is the ghost effect or the phantom array effect. The phantom array effect is visible when you move your eyes across a small light source or a very high contrast edge that is modulated. Then instead of seeing a blur, you see extended dots. I also call it uh, driving behind an expensive car effect because five years ago a lot of expensive cars had modulated brake lights. So when you would move your eyes across their backlights, you will see the phantom array effect. Okay. I will spend a bit more time on the effects themselves. I'll start with the stroboscopic effect. Again, that's the change in motion perception that is induced by a light stimulus that changes over time for a static observer but in a non-static environment. And that's what you can see in the picture. That's what I can also show you in a video. So in this video I will show you a difference between flicker and the stroboscopic effect. On the left you will see flicker, on the right you will see nothing for now. That's because there was nothing moving. The moment my colleague starts waving a chopstick, which by the way is a really really good detector of stroboscopic effect, you start seeing the stroboscopic effect. On the left, when, the, when she moves the chopstick, the stroboscopic effect is not visible. On the right, it is. Hope the video played for most of you. Go back to the basic causes of stroboscopic effect. Like I mentioned before, LEDs are connected to AC mains that provide 50 or 60 Hz modulated voltage. The LED drivers usually doubles the frequency and then tries to lower the modulation, but it's not always very successful. It really depends on the driver how much modulation ends up in the light. And again, things get more interesting when a dimmer is connected. So we know what the problem is, we know it where it comes from. Question is, can we model it? Can we find out when a certain temporal modulation is visible as the stroboscopic effect or not? And before that, we even have to answer the question, can we measure the sensitivity to the stroboscopic effect in a reliable way? You saw my colleague waving a chopstick. The problem with that is that you cannot have cannot ask them to wave the chopsticks with exactly 4 meters per second at the tip. So we first had to look into a way to find a methodology to reliably measure the influence, to reliably measure the stroboscopic effect, and then we can use that methodology to find out what it depends on and build a model of it. Also, we want to know that if the visibility of the effect depends on the application, yes or no. So I will give you an example, a series of experiments to answer the above questions. I was wondering if this part of the presentation will not be too technical, but I had a colleague recently ask me, how do people come up with these things when he looked at the measure that I will present at the end? So for you not to wonder this, I will give you a bit of a story about the trip that we actually took to get to the measure that I present at the end. <laughs> 
The first experiment is about methodology. The first thing we needed to do is find a stimulus that we can use to measure the visibility of the stereoscopic effect. We're very famous for having experiments that are really tough on the participants, but waving their hands for an hour doing a perception experiment is too much. So we tried to find what we can use instead of waving our hands. We use square waves due to simplicity of generation and widespread use of positive modulation. And this is the stimulus that we ended up using. It's a black disc with a white dot on it, connected to a well-controlled motor that we can change the speed of. And using that motor, we can move the white dot with four meters per second, which is more or less the maximum speed of hand movements for an average person in an office. So we're not talking about a baseball player pitching a ball, we're just talking about a normal person talking in an office. Once we f found out how we can measure the stereoscopic effect, we tried to see what it depends on. Does it depend on frequency, like flicker? Does it depend on duty cycle, again, like flicker? Maybe it depends also on the speed of the test stimulus. So this is the experiment that we designed next. Again, we used square waves. We used quite cold light at 500 lux, which is a normal light level for different frequencies, ranging from 50 to 400 hertz, different duty cycles from 10 to 90%, and different speed of the test stimulus. Modulation depth was actually adjusted to establish the visibility threshold. So what we did is we asked people if they see the stereoscopic effect, yes or no. And based on their answer, we changed the modulation depth. So how deep the modulation is until they find the threshold. And by threshold, we mean the point where a person can see the stereoscopic effect 50% of the time. So, does it depend on frequency? It does. So if you look at the threshold per frequency, you see the visibility threshold goes higher with frequency, which means that we are less sensitive to higher frequencies. And I can also show you how the stereoscopic effect at different frequency actually looks like. On the left, you see stereoscopic effect with 100 Hz, on the right, you see the effect with 500 Hz. You see that the faster modulation translates, I'll run it again, translates into smaller distance between the multiple images of the chopstick. Like I mentioned before, it also depends on the modulation depth. So for 100 Hz, a modulation depth of 100%, as you see now on the right, is clearly visible, while modulation depth of 25% is not visible at all. Okay, we are back. So it depends on frequency. It also turns out to be dependent on the speed of the rotating disc. And as we go to higher speeds, we are more sensitive. Which means that if we have a environment in which we have higher speeds than normal human movements, the stereoscopic effect will be more visible. This is important for the final measure, which was developed for the speeds, 4 meters per second, for human movements. There is also an effect of duty cycle. If we have 10% duty cycle, meaning that only 10% of the time the light is on, the rest is off, this is very different from 90% duty cycle, where most of the time the light is on and only 10% it is off. So you see that we are most sensitive around 30% duty cycle, and it falls off, to, falls off to both sides. I can also show you the effect of duty cycle in a video. On the left, we have 30% duty cycle, which as I said, is the worst I can do. And on the right, you have 95% duty cycle, which is indistinguishable from non-modulated light. I'll run this again. As you can see in the video, duty cycle is quite an important parameter. So if we ignore duty cycle, we can have two waveforms that have very different appearance, but seem to be the same.
Based on these results, we can also test if we can just use the Flickr index. Why get something, why develop something more complicated if we can only use the Flickr index? And if Flickr index would be a very good predictor of the visibility of the stereoscopic effect, all these points will be on one line. As you see, they're not. And there are two reasons why they're not. First is, with frequency, you become less, with increased frequency, you become less sensitive, but the flicker index does not change because it doesn't have frequency as parameter. Also, it does not take into account the duty cycle properly. So we know now what the influence quantities on the visibility of the stereoscopic effect are, but we used very simple waveforms. And we wondered what happens if we go to more complicated waveforms. How can we move the knowledge that we generated so far to complicated waveforms, like these? Sorry about this slide. This is the, probably the hardest slide and the next one that I'm going to use. But if we go back to the results of the Lange for Flickr, we can see that only the energy in the fundamental frequency matters. So we can take two different waveforms that have different energy in the fundamental frequency and see what the ratio between the thresholds for those two will be. For example, a square and a sine. And if modulation depth would be enough to explain the difference between a square and a sine, then the ratio from those thresholds would be 1. If flicker index would be a better predictor, the threshold would be 0.64. And if we look at the energy in the fundamental frequency, then the, frequ the, the ratio should be 0 0.79. If we run a perception experiment with squares and sines, we get on average remarkably 0 0.79. I rechecked the results because this looked too good to be true, but you see there is some variation across frequency at least. And the results were significantly different from both 0 0.64 and 1, but not from 0 0.79. So it seems that if we do use frequency analysis, we can have a good predictor for the stereoscopic effect. What happened here? Delange used very simple waveforms, square waves and triangular waves that have most of their energy in the fundamental frequency, but not in the higher frequencies. We wondered what happens if we have multiple frequencies that are all quite visible. Would they sum up? Would we only take the maximum? What will happen? So we did an experiment in which we showed different frequencies at equal visibility and then checked what happens. If there will be no summation, then the threshold will not depend on the number of frequencies that we use. But if we look at the graphs for two frequencies, three, and four frequencies, you see that the thresholds actually go down with the number of frequencies. So that means that they do sum up. Taken all into account, we can now propose a general method for predicting the visibility of the stereoscopic effect. We have a waveform. We do a Fourier transform of that waveform. We normalize for sensitivity for different frequencies because it depends on that, and then we sum up the different frequencies. Questions are, which sensitivity should we use, and how do we sum up? Which sensitivity should we use? We answered with doing the experiments with simple signs and squares for a very large number of participants. In both Eindhoven in the Netherlands and in China at the Southeast University. All experiments were done at 400 meters per second rotating speed of the disk and 500 lux. This is very important because this sensitivity curve is valid for applications where the fastest movements are moderate human movements. Then summation, based on the, res the graphs that I showed you with different frequencies and different sensitivity based on number of frequencies, we can find out how the summation is done and then get the summation coefficient, 3.7. Putting it all together brings us to their preferred measure for predicting the visibility of the stereoscopic effect, which is the SVM, or stereoscopic visibility measure.
as I mentioned before, it's based on spectral analysis in the frequency domain, has a sensitivity curve for moderate hand movements or human movements, and summation of the weighted Fourier components with this exponent, which is based on perception results. This produces a number between zero and around nine, and if this number is one, this means that the stereoscopic effect is just visible, meaning that if I show this level of modulation to a human, 50, 50 times it will say I see, he will say I see it, 50 times I don't see the effect. What the limit is acceptable in application depends on the application. Because different applications have different amount of movement and different risks. So with this I want to uh, finish the part on the stereoscopic effect and go to flicker. We define flicker as the perception of visual unsteadiness induced by a light stimulus whose luminance or spectral distribution fluctuates over time for a static observer in a static environment. The root cause is very similar to the stereoscopic effect, but because 100 Hz are not visible, you have to have troubles with your driver to have 50 Hz flicker. With dimmers, you can see almost any frequency in the light output. And new driver technologies also introduce lower frequencies quite often. Another source of flicker for LED luminaires are disturbances on mains voltage due to other electrical appliances, what IEC calls mains flicker. IEC has limits on the amount of disturbance that are allowed based on an incandescent lamp but depending on the driver, LEDs can be more or less susceptible to those disturbances. How do we quantify flicker? If we go back to the measurement methodologies, this is by far the most studied effect, so we hope that we can just directly use data from classical literature. Turns out not completely, because a number of things are specific to lighting. More import most importantly, Lighting is a full field. Most data has been done in a lab, has, most experiments have been done in a lab environment where you have a really small flickering target, which is not representative for lighting, which covers your full field. It's hard to do experiments on flicker because both the generation of the stimuli and their measurements of real world wave, waveforms is quite challenging. You can see as low as 0.2% at around 10 Hertz. Psychophysics are also challenging. Experiments are typically very hard for the participants. The visual fatigue builds up very fast and we have risk of headaches, epileptic attacks. So we exclude those type of participants from experiments. Another thing very specific to flicker is non-periodic flicker or what we call transient effects. Most root causes of stroboscopic effect produce periodic temporal modulation. On the other hand, for flicker, very often we see some waveforms that are not periodic. So we can have flashes or transients from one level to the other and almost anything in between. So for that, instead of having a method that works in the frequency domain, it's better to have a method in the time domain. Luckily, we already have such a method, and that is the IC short-term flicker in the for lighting, or PSD-LM. It has been recently published by the IEC in the documents that are referenced below. It's based on spectral analysis in the time domain. It uses a number of filters that represent the eye and the brain as they call it, and in the end it uses statistical summation of percentiles to come to a number which again gives you a similar measure of visibility. If PSD is 1, that means that flicker should be visible 50% of the time to, to an average observer. Problem with PSD is that it is based on data for a 2 degree visual field, so a very small flickering stimulus. Maybe it still works even for lighting. And we often get asked question, what cannot we use something simpler than PST? It looks very complicated. 
Well, we tried that. We put the person in a room where we had two different luminaires and we used 11 real-world waveforms chosen from measurements. And we asked the participants, we show a pair of waveforms, we ask them which one flickers more, left or right. If you ask 20 participants to do that, you can rank the waveforms based on how much flicker they produce, how much visible flicker they produce. And then you can correlate that to the output of different measures. So if you ask why can we just use flicker index or modulation depth, I would say because it's not much better than flipping a coin. Actually, probably it's better to flip a coin. You will have a higher correlation and it is still simpler than computing the flicker index. This is because flicker index and modulation depth have no idea what the frequency of modulation was. And PST is not perfect, but it still performs quite well. I will quickly talk about the phantom array effect. As I mentioned before, it is the change in perceived shape of spatial layout of objects that is induced by light stimulus that changes over time for a non-static observer in an otherwise static environment. So if an observer moves their eyes, they have exactly the same causes as the stroboscopic effect from temporal modulation point of view, but it is different because it is only visible when the eye makes a saccade across a high contrast luminance pattern that is temporally modulated. One notable application where this is very visible is automotive backlights, as I mentioned before, where the phantom array effect is prominent, stroboscopic effect is almost not visible. This is because automotive backlights typically have an environment with very high contrast, very small source, but still the relative speed of movements are quite low, so you don't see the stroboscopic effect. We spend a lot of time explaining all the experiments that have been done either previously or in our group for stroboscopic effect for flicker. For phantom array, unfortunately, we have much less. Instead of a sensitivity curve, we have these two points. But what we know is that the human visual system processes eye movement differently than object movement. So it is a different effect. Limited studies show similar sensitivity to the stroboscopic effect, but we still need more data. To measure the phantom array effect, we also need to induce eye movement with a certain speed. That's also another complication that makes these experiments very hard. That's why we have so little data. Okay, I'm finishing up. And first I want to share with you what's happening in standards and regulations. Have to start with the CIETC 183 which was made to make proper definitions and introduce models for modeling the visibility of stroboscopic effect, flicker, and phantom array effect. A technical note from TC183 is expected to be published this summer. The work of uh, the TC is far from finished, but because of the urgency of the problem, we decided to publish a technical note, more or less in the middle of the tenure of the technical committee, and this technical note, with, which include the definitions and the recommendations from this webinar. So, use SVM and PST. Maybe you've heard about the IEEE standard 1789. You often get questions about this standard and asking if we can use this for predicting the visibility of flicker and the stroboscopic effect. My comment on the IEEE 1789 is that it gives a very nice overview of potential health effects of modulated lighting. So it's a very good document for that. But it promotes modulation depth to quantify temporal light artifacts. Modulation depth for different frequencies. But if you noticed in the fourth video, if you have different duty cycle, even though you have the same frequency and same modulation depth, you can have an extreme effect or no effect. So because of that, I believe that just using modulation depth for frequency is not enough to quantify temporal light artifacts. So before we try to set limits, we wanted to first get proper ways of measuring temporal light artifacts. Above that, it is also overly strict 
which could add unnecessary cost, limit the lifetime of drivers, and efficiency of LED products. To conclude, I hope I convinced you that it's not all flicker. Temporal modulation is different from the effect that it has on humans on machines. So I would like to be more careful when we discuss temporal modulation and flicker. Some people use flicker when they mean temporal modulation. These are different things and I hope that we can discuss them as different things. The effects of temporal modulation on vision are not all flicker. And if nothing moves and you can see it, only then it is flicker. If you only see it when some, an object moves, then it's a stereoscopic effect. And if you see it when you move your eyes, then it's ghosting or phantom array effect. Recommendations for measures are SVM for the stereoscopic effect, IC light flicker meter PST LM for flicker. We should work on fixing the field of view problem in the sensitivity curve used there. That's still to come. And I would really be grateful if you help us get more data on ghosting, Phantom Ray effect. The work here is not done because we need more work in understanding how to use these proposed measures in real world meteorology. What are the uncertainties of these measures? How to have a hardware setup to properly compute these measures? And last but not least, we had a lot of fun in the last four years doing these things and we, alloyed, we also annoyed a lot of participants. To those participants, I want to say sorry and thank you. And also to all of you, I want to say thank you for the attention. Thank you.